what she said, and it was a circus. We need a conviction, and we need a, a sentence that reflects the loss of life. Greenland has enough ice to raise sea levels by 25 feet. In her first social media post since going missing in June, Fan Bingbing, China's highest paid actress, apologized for dodging taxes by concealing her earnings and praised the country's Communist Party. State media reports that authorities will let Fan avoid criminal charges if she and her associated companies pay $129 million in fines and back taxes. Fan's whereabouts are still unknown. More than a third of Americans eat fast food every day. A CDC study found that 20 to 39-year-olds eat it daily more than any other age group, a habit that drops off the older they get. And contrary to popular assumptions, the people eating fast food on a given day are more likely to be wealthier. Japan's practice of hunting say whales in the North Pacific has been deemed illegal by an international body that regulates the trade of endangered animals. CITES says that by taking thousands of tons of whale meat from international waters and selling it domestically, Japan is illegally trading across borders, and if it doesn't stop, it could face trade sanctions. That thing you got today was FEMA's first ever test of its presidential alert system, set up in 2016 to be used in case of a national emergency. The alert hit more than 200 million phones after a judge threw out a last minute lawsuit claiming the messages were akin to, quote, planting a government controlled loudspeaker in the home and on the person of every American. Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court hangs on the votes of four senators who haven't made up their minds. Today, three of them, all Republicans, spoke out to condemn President Trump for mocking Christine Blasey Ford at a campaign rally in Mississippi last night. 36 years ago, this happened. I had one beer, right? I had one beer. Well, you think it was, nope, it was one beer. Oh, good. How did you get home? I don't remember. How'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. I don't know. A Quinnipiac poll out yesterday shows that 55% of women now oppose the Kavanaugh nomination, but 37% support Kavanaugh, nationwide at least. At the Trump event in Mississippi, that number was closer to 100. President Trump came here to South Haven, Mississippi last night, ostensibly to campaign for Republican Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. And he did manage to mention her. A true Mississippi patriot, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. But as usual, Trump didn't stick to the script. He went off about his own achievements and vehemently defended Brett Kavanaugh. But I've been hearing there's this guy named Brett Kavanaugh, who is... who is like a perfect person who's destined for the Supreme Court. I've heard that for a long time. And a lot of the women here were right there with him. She was paid to say what she, was, what she said, and it was a circus. Mm -hmm. And when you watched his testimony, did it change your feeling about him? Did no. you sympathize with him? Did you? I think he's 100% correct. I think he's right on. He's, he's what we need. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I mean, he's already been investigated six times by the FBI. That ought to tell you something. Since his life is being ruined, I just think it's very unfair. I don't think he's getting a fair shake. Mm -hmm. um, I feel sorry for his family. And if, if we're going to say it doesn't matter what Bill Clinton did 35, 40 years ago, then I don't care what Brett did 35 years ago. And if something like that did happen to her, and it was indeed Justice Kavanaugh, would you say he should be on the Supreme Court? Um, well, there's there's no way for us to really know if it did happen. So... Mm, FBI is investigating now. They are, yeah. and I cannot wait. They need to be doing some more investigating of everybody that's involved. Trump also used the rally to hit again on what seems to be a new GOP message, that Me Too is a threat to men everywhere. Think of your son. Think of your husband. It was a concern shared, or quickly assimilated, by Trump supporters. 
I worry about them. I said, you better watch what parties they go to in college. Make sure you're with the look. I'm still preaching to them because women will say stuff. Is that kind of what you take away from watching these hearings, that, that this kind of thing worries you? Yes. Yeah? I'm if, you do, if you do the wrong thing, then you never know. You they all, 30 years later, you can get accused. They always believe the girl. We don't yes. have a, they never believe us. And that makes me bad. Right-wing populism is surging in Europe. Voters in Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic and Italy have installed nationalist anti-immigrant leaders in high office. And other leaders who share their views are pushing for power around the continent. That alignment has created a significant political force and also an opportunity for a right-wing organiser without a job, Steve Bannon. Bannon wants to unite Europe's populist forces, something he calls the movement. After the November elections, when President Trump defeats the cultural Marxist Democratic Party and is not impeached, I will be spending, you know, 80% of my time in Europe in preparation for the European parliamentary elections. To get the movement going, Bannon is working with a local partner, Belgium lawyer, Michel Modricman. When we met in London, it was a match. I and mean, basically, you know, we were having the same vision of what's happened and what should be done. And, and Steve say, look, I could, have, I could have finished your sentence and you could have finished mine. And it's true. You agree on everything? Yeah, we agree on everything. Uh, from the beginning, on the, uh, the principle. Modricuma made his money representing shareholders during the financial crisis. He uses his fortune to dabble in politics. Now, he and Bannon are training their sights on the European parliamentary elections in May. And the movement is offering members support in the way of polling, digital strategy and data analysis. We want to concentrate on what is uniting us. But it will be for sure border, uh, sovereignty, fight against radical Islam and limitation of migration. These four tenets, we know that from north to south, east to west, everybody can, can go beyond that. And so you set up the movement yeah. uh, with about $3,000. Yeah. Other than the fame that Bannon's association with Trump brings to your movement, what else does Bannon bring? Is it money? The idea is to liaise. So in order to liaise, the, the idea came from Europe. But what does Bannon bring? So ba Bannon presumably... First of all, he's bringing his experience and prestige. You know, he was instrumental uh, in uh, getting the election of the President of the United States. And for sure, he brings a lot of exposure, you know, to the press particularly. Mm. Is he uh, useful for bringing in money, though? It will be useful to bring money, no doubt. I mean, uh, he will have his, uh, his donors. I think he will also put part of his own money into, into this too. Europe's right is rallying. Hungary's Viktor Orban has become its poster child. His hardline anti-immigration policies have led to the threat of EU sanctions. Pro-sovereignty populists are uniting in his defence. One of them is Matteo Salvini, now Deputy Prime Minister of Italy and also the movement's first official member. Bannon and Modricman just signed him up last month. What does being in mean? In the, the meaning you are a member of the club. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know, but this, we're not in the playground anymore. Being in, is that a formal agreement? It is a verbal formal agreement. I explain him, as I do with you, the objective of the movement. I ask him whether he wanted to join. He said to me, yes, we, we are joining. Secondly, if he would be participating over, in our first summit, he said to me, yes, provide the time available. And, and three, can I make it public? As simple as that. And to be a member of our club will be on our internet site. Are there membership fees? No. No? No. Is it, what's the extent of his commitment? I mean, can he influence the direction of the movement? The, the members... If he has disagreements with the, it? The, there cannot be disagreement. If we are a member of, a club, of this club, Hungary, uh, Poland, okay. Italy... Law, so have Law and Justice Party, have they signed up? In Poland? We'll, we'll see. 
we'll talk to them. Yeah. Would you like them to? We'll talk to them. We'll see. We, we let, Have you spoken we, to them yet? We, we, we don't speak to them. We speak so many people to, to, to speak to and to me that we didn't speak to them yet. But it may be that potential members have reservations about Modricamen. Some would-be allies have already said they're not interested in what he's cooking up. Blams Bellang, another Belgian party. Yeah. Gerolf Annemans, member of the European Parliament, also affiliated in the same European Parliament grouping as Salvini. He said outright, I'm never going to work with Mr. Mudrikman. Fine. Fine. <laughs> you won't be a member of the club. I have no problem with this. But why wouldn't he want to be? Because he and his party share lots of the same... They, they share these four fundamental values of the movement. We have such a large interest from all over that I really don't care about those for whatsoever reason that express reserve or say that they don't want to join. By the way, you have to be invited to, to join. You have to be invited, okay. <laughs> there are those who obviously are our natural partners and that there are those who are maybe what I would call in a gray zone we are very clearly, Steve and myself, basically, we have to take a decision whether we individually invite them or not. Does Steve Bannon understand Europe and its nuances, do you think? He understands perfectly the dynamics of politics. He understands exactly the problem of the common guy. Know that he knows less Europe than he would know uh, the US policy, then that's obvious. But that's why we are, it's a partnership, and it's, it's learning fast. The movement is a club with only one official member. Its website isn't live yet, and the summit, originally scheduled for this summer, still hasn't happened. Sounds like you've got a bit of work to do. It's great, that's why when you say they don't want to, to, to see us or to talk, this is bullshit. They are all lining up, all lining up. I don't say it's for my, my, my blue eyes, no? No, no it's what, for what we offer. I'm sure that, you know, there are people that don't like me and it's just like, who cares? Who cares? Closing arguments begin tomorrow in the trial of Jason Van Dyke. Van Dyke is the first Chicago police officer to be charged with first degree murder since 1980 for firing 16 shots into 17 year old Laquan McDonald in 2014. All of it captured on dash cam video. The city of Chicago refused to release the footage for more than a year. When it finally got out, it galvanized activists, pushed out a police superintendent and a state's attorney, damaged the careers of other officers, and certainly didn't help Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who now is not running for a third term. It's four more years for our children, not four more years for me. Van Dyke's defense has tried to get the jury to see things from his literal perspective, emphasizing the fear that he felt and the fast-paced decisions that he had to make. Officers often don't testify, fearing self-incrimination and knowing that often juries side with them anyway. But yesterday, Van Dyke took the stand. How close did he get to you? He got probably about 10 to 15 feet away from me. He turned his torso towards me. And what if anything he do with his arm? He waved the knife from his lower right side upwards across his body towards my left shoulder. And when he did that, what did you do, officer? I shot him. Prosecutors say the video shows McDonald veering in a different direction and that at no point does he raise the three inch knife in his hand. When asked why he continued to fire, even when the teen hit the ground, Van Dyke insisted that he thought McDonald was going to get back up and that the dash cam video doesn't show his perspective. But the video seems to show someone lifeless on the ground. To many, the difference between what Van Dyke says and what's seen in the video is pretty outrageous. Reverends James Moody and Jeanette Wilson are some of the many people who've watched this trial closely. My concern is that 
there is an attempt to play on the emotions of the jury as opposed to dealing with the facts. Do you think Laquan McDonald has been put on trial in some way? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it brought yes. prior bad acts of a juvenile. Of a juvenile. Who did nothing that night. He didn't threaten anyone. He never uh, made any of the other officers feel like they were in harm's way. I wanted to know, did he cry after the first shot? Did he cry when he saw the boy on the ground? When did you cry that night, since you have so much compassion? The jury could start deliberating as early as tomorrow. The Chicago Police Department told Vice News that they're ready for anything and that they've already prepared officers to take on 12-hour overtime shifts. Activists have been preparing for months for what they're going to do if Jason Van Dyke is acquitted. It's going to be uproar. I think the city is going to come out in mass. I don't want violence, but you know, uh, when emotions, you can't stop everybody from doing what they want to do. I just hope they don't tear up their own community. Do you think that this will change anything, this trial? I mean, it may, it, for, for us, you got to think, Jason Van Dyke even being prosecuted over the national scale of things, very seldom do they even get to this point. So is that a victory? It's a victory in itself, but we need a conviction and we need a, a sentence that reflects the loss of life. This summer, a chunk of ice the size of Lower Manhattan broke off a glacier in eastern Greenland. It contained 10 billion tons of ice, and the video of the event was a perfectly shareable piece of climate change dread. Except a team of NASA scientists studying sea level rise has much more dreadful, much less visible news. Glaciers aren't just melting from above, they're melting from below. Over the past few years, Eric Rignot has been measuring glaciers in Greenland as part of a NASA expedition called Oceans Melting Greenland, or OMG. We haven't seen that in a long time. The mission's main objective is to study the biggest and most overlooked source of glacial melt, warm ocean currents hundreds of meters below the surface. So you're scanning the seafloor right now? Yeah. We're measuring the glacier you know, all the way to the foot of the glacier. I mean, your feet basically it is standing uh, in the water. Right, right now we are going under where the glacier used to be. You know, you can see landmarks, you know, along the side of the glacier, evidence of uh, the loss of ice. Unlike most bodies of water, the ocean surrounding Greenland actually gets warmer with increasing depth. That's because warm, salty currents from the Atlantic are heavier than fresh glacial water. So those currents end up on the bottom. And that is why NASA is mapping the ocean floor. As Greenland's deepest waters warm, the biggest glaciers melt at increasing speeds. And figuring out just how fast that's happening may help humans figure out just how much hurt we're in for. Did we always know that glaciers were melting from the bottom? No, this is uh, something we started uh, thinking about maybe 10 years ago. 10 years ago? Yeah. Why did you think it took so long? Probably because we saw so many changes in the glaciers, you really have to figure out what is missing here and understanding. Prior to that, probably people never asked the question because there's no uh, dramatic change in the glaciers that they could relate to. Between 2002 and 2016, Greenland lost about 280 gigatons of ice a year. That amount of melted ice, which would be enough to fill more than a billion Olympic-sized swimming pools, caused global sea levels to rise measurably. And as the oceans warm, that's only going to increase. The glaciers that are really big and really deep are the ones that we should be worried about. Yes. The water not only melts the glaciers from below, 
So it, it produces some calving, it forces the glaciers to retreat. It's like opening a dam. They are the major control on what's happening on the ice sheets. They control everything. That might be the mail channel. The OMG mission is trying to create the most comprehensive picture of Greenland's glacial coastline ever made. Eric does this from the ocean surface by sailing into iceberg crowded fjords to gather data on the hardest to reach glaciers. But there's another component of the mission that's gathering a much broader set of data from the sky. Oh, yeah. That's where Josh that's Willis comes in. He runs the OMG mission out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. So this is our ocean survey, basically. This is all the places we just got back from. All the dots are places where we're measuring the temperature and salinity of the ocean. We fly this plane around and we drop sensors out of the plane. They fall on a little parachute and when they reach the ocean, they split into two parts, and a part stays at the surface, and the other part falls, and it falls all the way down to the sea floor, a thousand meters. And as it goes, it's measuring the temperature and the saltiness of the water, and then that gets radioed back to the plane in real time. So that'll give us a really good picture of what's going on all the way around Greenland. Why focus so much energy and money on Greenland? Greenland has enough ice to raise sea levels by 25 feet if it all melted today. Now, we don't think that the ice is going to melt in one year, but the difference between 25 feet in a thousand years and 25 feet in a couple hundred years is actually devastating as well. And that's really what we're trying to get at with OMG, because if the ice sheet is going to melt quickly, it will be because of this ocean ice interaction, not because of the air warming. And if we're reshaping the coastline in a radical way, you know, do you want to take out a 30 year mortgage on a house that might be flooded in 30 years? And so it's real and it's time to start dealing with it. How deep is it? 200. How does it make you feel to see all of this change? I think it's, uh, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to convey the magnitude of the change to the public. Some of these changes are so dramatic. There's a sort of uh, implicit denial. It's, it just can't be true. It can't be happening so fast, right? You're just exaggerating. Or, or maybe it's just a few warm summers. Um, but it's not like that. Uh, these changes are pretty big. And this is just the beginning. 